Father in heaven, again, we praise and thank thee, O Lord, for this time which you have given to us to gather in this blessed forum set up by the family of Brother Benoni Richards. At this time, O Lord, we always remember the rich legacy of his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Richards, who started this Bible study many years ago physically, whereby, O Lord, many of us were blessed and benefited. I am one of the major beneficiaries of this Bible study, O Master. I call upon thy special blessings to be poured upon each and every participant at this time, O Lord. They could have been elsewhere at this point of time, but they have decided to spend this time in your presence because they love you and they want to grow scripturally and spiritually. We commit the next one hour or so into your hands. Let every thought, word, and action of ours bring thee joy and glory. In Jesus' holy precious name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So as usual, dear friends, uh, we will start with the general slide, um, which is which is bringing before us the methodology used for Bible study. Um, unless we take the three steps, the purpose of Bible study is not achieved. One is observing the scriptures. Second, interpreting the scriptures. What we have observed, we understand its meaning. And third, and most important thing is application. What we have learned by way of Bible study, we have to apply it in our day-to-day -day Christian living. We may be reading from so-called Old Testament portion of the Bible, but everything has been written down to serve as a warning for us and to also engender hope in us. When Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, I'm asking a question to the group. You may give me an answer in the public chat or unmute and give me an answer. All these things have been written to serve as a warning for us. Whom did he have in mind? Christians or Israelites? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. Christians. Uh, how does First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11 start? It starts with the Israelite history. How they were delivered from the Egyptian slavery. How the Lord shepherded them through the Red Sea. But still, they were disobedient. So, they had to reap what they had sown. Uh, again, I'll take the help of Sister Jayamala. Uh, before we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, if you read the first four verses, it is a description of the Israeli history. Sister, please help us out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, Mm. God, was not, ah. God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now okay, these sir. things. When, thank you, sister. When they were disobedient, their body bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And whom is Paul having in mind? The Israelites who were delivered from the Egyptian slavery. So, in which portion of uh, the Bible is the? Uh, History of Israel written in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? I'm asking you a question. <laughs> Old, Testament. Old Testament. So, dear friends, sometimes Christians, you know, they have a wrong opinion or a wrong notion. What is there to learn in the Old Testament? Are they? Apostle Paul himself is uh, writing these words. All these things have been written to serve as a warning for us. And whenever the Israelites were obedient, let us take the golden age of David's rule. When Israelites flourished, there was uh, nobody had the courage to attack Israel. Now, what do we learn from the golden age of the David's rule? The lesson to be learned is when we are obedient, the blessings abound in our lives. Dear friends, one biblical scholar put it very creatively and succinctly. He said, the entire Israeli history is an outworking of the Deuteronomic covenant. What is there in Deuteronomy chapter 28? We are going to come to that. The list of blessings for being obedient and the list of curses for being disobedient. When you look into the Israeli history, you see 
it is virtually an outworking of the Deuteronomic covenant. And we are now focusing on the book of Deuteronomy only. And in the uh, days to come, we'll be focusing more specifically on Deuteronomy chapter 28. So what all we learn, we need to absorb it in our Christian lives and apply it in day-to-day -day Christian living. Unless we apply the truths learned in the Bible study in our day-to-day -day Christian living, the purpose behind Bible study is not achieved. Now, one more scripture portion. I will request Sister Jayamala to read, and then I will ask you a question. Uh, Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. I, the Lord, do not change. <laughs> Our Lord doesn't change. Okay. Uh, one person, one philosopher said, the only thing permanent in life is change. Okay. <laughs> only thing permanent in life is change. It applies to most of the things in this planet Earth. But it doesn't apply to God's character. Today we are using smartphones. Many years back we were using only small cell phones of Nokia. Then some years before we were using only landlines. But they have become obsolete virtually. And today we are using smartphones. Yes, what that philosopher said. Only thing permanent in life is changed is applicable to most of the things on planet Earth. But it doesn't apply to God. He's changeless. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. My question to the group. When the Israelites were obedient, they were blessed. So when Christians are also obedient, will we not be blessed? <laughs> Give me a yes. thought. Yes. Yes. So when Israelites were disobedient, they were at the receiving end of the Lord's chastisement. Today, if we disobey, will we not also be at the receiving end of the Lord's chastisement? Yes or no? Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Yes. yes. And after 1 Corinthians chapter 10 comes 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And what does Paul write in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Those who are indulging in immorality and participating in the Lord's table. What happened to them? Again, I'll take the help of Sister Jayamala to read the scripture portion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30. Those who were disobedient, those who indulged in immorality and were participating in the Lord's table, what happened to them? That is why many among you are weak and ill and a number of you have fallen asleep. Many of you are sick, weak and many of you have fallen asleep. Means many of you have died prematurely. And uh, those of us who have walked with the Lord for many, many years, we are all witnesses to those Christians who are at the receiving end of the Lord's chastisement. I know of many Christians who are crippled, who are paralyzed, who, who became bedridden because of their disobedience to God. God was settling their accounts here on planet Earth itself. And what does Apostle Paul say? Why does God uh, punish uh, the Christians specifically? So that we are not condemned with the rest of the world on the judgment day. Our accounts are settled here. Uh, Sister, continue to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You can read verses 31 and 32 also. 31 and 32. But if we were more discerning with, the, with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So that we are not finally condemned with the world. But who would like to die prematurely? <laughs> That's why Paul says, if we are discerning in this matter, we would not be at the receiving end of the Lord's chastisement. So, dear friends, <clears throat> our Lord is unchanging. All scriptures have been written for two purposes. One, to serve as a warning. Second, to serve as, to, second, to engender hope in us. When we are obedient, when we are walking in the straight and narrow path, yes. The presence of the Lord is with us. When the presence of the Lord is with us, we are bound to be victorious. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. The battle may be hard, but we are bound to be victorious because Lord's presence means victory. Victory means the Lord's presence. Okay? So, and now we'll go into the slideshow. Uh, Brother Chandu has prepared for us. Uh, 
dear friends, we have come to chapter 17 of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, I always use subheadings all beginning with the common alphabet or rhyming subheadings. Uh, chapter 17 to understand it in a better way. I'm using subheadings beginning with a letter alphabet W. First is worthy. Second is wipe out. Third is wind up. Wind up means completely close it. And then uh, the fourth one is way of line. Uh, we will go step by step. We have already covered worthy and wipe out in our previous session. Today we will focus upon wind up and way of life. And one more uh, uh, issue, subject which I would like to bring before you, or one more matter which I would like to disclose before the um, group members is because there may be first timers in our group. Uh, whenever I use subheadings uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, while studying the book of Deuteronomy, I use color coding, green color, to reflect on those subjects which have been already been covered before in the first four books of the Bible. That is from Genesis to Numbers. And red color to depict those subjects which are unique to the book of Deuteronomy. Why is book of Deuteronomy known as the book of Deuteronomy? What is the meaning of the word deutero? Deutero means second time, second time. So uh, Moses is standing before a new generation virtually. Those of them who had experienced the deliverance from Egypt, they had all died except Joshua and Caleb. Now he's standing before a new generation. He is exhorting them, encouraging them, strengthening them in their faith as they are about to conquer Canaan. So he is repeating those commandments which this generation has not heard before. That is why the book of Deuteronomy is known as the book of Deuteronomy. We are using green colors to depict those subjects which have been covered already in the first four books of the Bible. That is from Genesis to Numbers. And we are using red color to symbolize those subjects or to depict those subjects which are unique to the book of Deuteronomy. Now, um, verse 1, you have to offer only blemishless animals as sacrifices, already covered in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3. Then, as regards minimum two or three witnesses to arrive at a verdict in a court case, already covered in Numbers chapter 35, verse 30. Brother Chandu point a at uh, Numbers 35, 30. So, <clears throat> uh, that is why we are using green color. But when it comes to the subjects covered in verses 8 to 20, these subjects are unique to the book of Deuteronomy and that is why we are using red color. Okay. Uh, now we'll go to wind up. Before uh, I show you the next line, okay, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. In Indian judicial system, in Indian judicial system, there is an escalation matrix, okay? In ju Indian judicial system, there is an ex escalation matrix, okay? Who is at the top of the hierarchy? If the lower courts are unable to decide or give the final verdict, to which Supreme court can court. we appeal? Supreme, Supreme court. court, Chief Justice. Supreme Court, very good, right answer. <laughs> uh, Brother Stephen says, uh, President also, President is entitled to give uh, the presidential pardon. That is, uh, if somebody is given the capital punishment or the death penalty, the president has the right to overrule, overrule the ruling of even the Supreme Court. But that comes into picture only in the matter of death sentences. But when it comes to the escalation matrix in the judicial system, the higher most court is the Supreme Court. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, then I will I'll be requesting Sister Jayamala to read. How is the escalation matrix in the... Um, Israeli courts or in the Israeli society. Now, just look at this slide. I put the escalation matrix in the Indian judicial system. It all starts in a small way. Uh, court of small co causes for metropolitan cities or similarly, Munsif's court or court of subjects, third class. Then it goes up to subordinate judge, class two. Then subordinate judge, class one. Then it comes to the notice of district court and additional district judges. If they are, if their verdict is also not accepted by both the parties or one of the two parties, then the matter is referred to the High Court. <coughs> Brother Chandu, <laughs> pointer, Kazar at the High Court. And if the verdict of the High Court is also not accepted by 
both the parties or one of the two parties, then finally the Supreme Court has to come into the picture. This is the escalation matrix in the Indian judicial system. Similarly, what does the Lord say as regards the judicial system in the Israeli society? Sister uh, Jayamala will read from verse 8 onwards uh, till verse 13. See, if the judges at lower level are not able to solve the cases or they are not able to give the verdict, then they'll have to bring it to the notice of the Levites who are virtually God's representatives. They look at the entire case as though the Lord is looking at them because they are virtually Lord's representatives and the Lord gives them the wisdom to know who is in the right and who is in the wrong. Uh, Sister Jayamala, uh, as Sister Jayamala is uh, reading the scripture portion, Brother Chandu will be pointing a cursor at the Levitical judges who are on the left side in the picture. Okay, Sister Jayamala, please read it out. Deuteronomy 17, 8 onwards. If cases come before your courts that are too difficult for you to judge, whether bloodshed, lawsuits, or assaults, take them to the place the Lord your God will choose. Go to the Levitical priest and to the judge who is in office at that time. Enquire of them and they will give you the verdict. You they must will act give you the verdict. The Levites, the priests will give you the verdict because the Lord has endowed them with the needed wisdom to discern who is in the right and who is in the wrong. My question to the group, if somebody brings a case to the court, will anybody uh, in that court case ever say, I am in the wrong? <laughs> no. No. That is why they are fighting a court case. No. Uh, between the two parties, when the court case is on, None of them will say, I am in the wrong. So it is for the judge to discern who is in the right and who is in the wrong. We have seen that wonderful court verdict of King Solomon when two mothers came and disputed before him. This is my child. This is my child. Each, each one was claiming that the living son was theirs. And King Solomon used God-given wisdom to discern the truth and to arrive at the fair verdict. So before the kings come into the picture, see, uh, Deuteronomy was written at a time when the uh, leaders of the nation of Israel would be virtually be priests or prophets. We see during the judges' time, I'm asking you a question. Who was Samuel the judge? Who was Samuel the judge? Was he a Levite? Yes, yes, first. Yes, right answer. So, like that, the Lord would be using uh, the Levites, the priests, and what about Eli? Eli was also the judge. He was also the high priest. Okay. So, the Lord would endow this priest, this Levites, with divine wisdom to discern who is in the right and who is in the wrong. Continue, sister. If anybody doesn't accept that verdict, what should be done? Continue, sister. Jamala. Be careful to do everything they instruct you to do. Act according to whatever they teach you and the decisions they give you. Do not turn aside from what they tell you to the right or to the left. Anyone who shows contempt for the judge or for the priest who stands ministering there to the Lord your God is to be put to death. You must purge the evil from Israel. All the people will hear and be afraid and will not be contemptuous again. So even in India today, dear friends, contempt of court is a grave offense. Is it not? Give me yes or no. <laughs> in the public chat or you can unmute and give me an answer. Even today, in 2023 in India or in anywhere in the world, it's not contempt of court a grave offense? Yes. Yes. So even in those days, if the Levites, if the priests, if the God ordained judges given verdict, if people are not accepting it, they are going against it, what should be the penalty imposed on them? Death penalty. So that others do not indulge in this grave offense of contempt of court. They will be afraid to commit this kind of crimes, this kind of, uh, you know, 
sins of going against the verdict of the judges. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, as I told you at the very beginning of my Bible study, the purpose of the Bible study of the Old Testament is not achieved till we connect it to our dispensation of grace. We are living in a new dispensation. Again, I repeat, the purpose of Bible study of the Old Testament scriptures is not achieved till we apply it in our day-to-day -day Christian living or connect it to New Testament scripture portion. Now, suppose if there is a dispute between two Christians, okay, what should be done? What does the scripture say? Does New Testament give us uh, instructions as to how to go about if there is a dispute between two Christians? Yes, we need not go beyond 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Dear friends, I'm going slightly deep into this subject. Okay, when 1 Corinthians was written down by Apostle Paul, he knew what were the issues in the church at Corinth. Okay, listen to me very carefully. I'm asking you a question. If a patient is brought before, an accident patient is brought before a doctor, who is that patient who has been involved in an accident? The doctor observes that he has minor leg injury. At the same time, a serious brain injury. Okay? The doctor observes in the emergency ward that this accident patient or this accident victim has a minor leg injury and also serious brain injury. What will this doctor do in the emergency ward? Will he go about treating the minor leg injury or bra serious brain injury? Brain injury. <laughs> Very good. Right answer. So, when you look at Paul's epistle to the Corinthian church, the first epistle, you know, already they had brought some matters to Paul's notice. Should we marry in these troubled times when church is undergoing persecution? How should we behave at the communion table? Should we eat the food offered to the idols? How should we go about using the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that the church service takes place in an orderly way? These were the matters which were brought before Paul's notice. But when he is writing the epistle to the church, he is addressing matters of greatest concern in the beginning and then only coming to those matters. Now, when you come to uh, the first six chapters of the book of, uh, or rather the epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, the first epistle of Paul to Corinthians, he is dealing with very serious matters, which is affecting the very life of that church. And then, after giving a solution to those problems, I'll share with you what are those problems, just look at uh, how he's uh, coming to matters of uh, less concern or less uh, seriousness uh, in chapter 7, verse 1. How does he start chapter 7, verse 1? Uh, Sister Jaimala will read it out for us. And uh, Brother Israel also from the Living Bible. Now for the matters... Mm. Now for the matters... Sister, please unmute and read. Yes, yes, Pastor. You want yeah. me to read again? Yeah, it's now for the matters. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Yeah, brother, is since... right. uh, let us read from the Living Bible also. See, after addressing matters of grace concern, which is affecting the very life of the church, is coming to the minor matters. You wrote to me, should we marry or not? You wrote to me whether we should eat the food offered to idols or not. You wrote to me how to go about the communion service. Now I'm coming to those matters. Brother, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, brother, in the Living Bible also. Brother Israel. Yeah, one second. Chapter 7, verse 1. Mm. About those questions you asked in your last letter, mm. my answer is that if you do not marry, it is good. Yeah. Now coming to those matters which you wrote to me about. So, <laughs> these matters have been brought to Apostle Paul because he is the founding father of that church. The Lord used him to found that church. Uh, whatever doubts they have, the church members approach Apostle Paul just like a son approaches the father or a student approaches the teacher. 
So he knows what are those matters of minor importance. What are those matters of major importance? He is dealing with that in the first six chapters. Just I'm using some creative language to make you remember. The first four chapters are all about the problem of division in the church. There's lack of unity. They are identifying themselves to certain leaders. Some are saying, I'm follower of Paul. Some are saying, saying they are followers of Peter. Some are saying we are followers of Apollo. Paul asks them pointedly, did I die for your sins? Or did Apollo die for your sins? Or Peter for, uh, die for your sins? You are all followers of Jesus Christ. Not of this leader or that leader. Lack of unity can destroy the church. So the first four chapters are all about division. The fifth chapter, last week also we, did, uh, we focused upon that. That is the problem of fornication. A church elder is having sexual relationship with his own stepmother. He is dealing with that very serious matter in the fifth chapter. And in the sixth chapter, now I am coming to what is connected to book of Deuteronomy chapter 17. He is addressing the problem of litigation in the Corinthian church. First four chapters, division. Fifth chapter, fornication. Sixth chapter, litigation. These people are taking the disputes before unbelievers. And let us look at what Apostle Paul says. He's taking them to task. Uh, Sister Jayamala, please read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the first five verses. Unless we make a connection to New Testament mm -hmm. scripture portion, dear friends, the purpose of reading the Old Testament scripture portion is not achieved. Okay? 1 Corinthians 6, first four verses. First if any verses. of you if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge tri trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Thank but you. Instead, okay. ah, but instead, okay, but instead, one brother takes another to court and this is in front of unbelievers. Look at this, look at this. If the Israelites are having a dispute, I'm asking a question, give me an answer in the public chat. If the Israelites are having a dispute within their society, are they bringing their dispute before the Egyptian pharaoh? Give me yes or no. Are they bringing no. their problem before the Egyptian pharaoh? No. 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 <laughs> they are solving the problem in-house. There the covenant is with the nation. The first Corinthians chapter 10, verse first five verses. Sister Jayamala read. How many times huh, the word all is used? Five times. All of them were delivered from Egyptian slavery. All were baptized in the Red Sea. All committed themselves to the leadership of Moses. All ate manna. All ate the what? All drank the water from the rock. All, all. It's a national covenant. And the Lord is expecting the problem to be solved within. The country. And here in New Testament, the covenant of the Lord is with the local church. I'll ask you a question. When the Lord is addressing the seven churches in the city, in the country of Turkey, in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, is he taking the church at Sardis to task for the, mis for the loopholes found in, in the church at Laodicea? Yes or no? No. No. Similarly, for the loopholes found in the church at Pergamon, is he taking the church at Theatira to task? No. No. So the covenant is with the local church. Are you, there are wise people in every church. There are leaders whom the Lord has blessed them with wisdom to discern who is in the right and who is in the wrong. Why are you taking this matters before the ungodly judges, the Gentile judges? What will they think of your testimony? 
First Peter, when we read, dear friends, he writes, when it is so difficult uh, for the righteous to go to heaven, how difficult it is for the ungodly. If judgment always begins at home, judgment means the divine judgment. If it is so difficult for a righteous man to go to heaven, how difficult it is for the ungodly. And here we see in the modern day churches, property issues, this issue, that issue, it has been brought before the Gentile judges. Flagrant violation of the scriptures. First of all, that those kind of horrific disputes should not arise in the church. That itself is showing both the disputing parties are totally ungodly, totally not caring about God's glory. That is why they are fighting over uh, church property and all that. Totally ungodly. And they reap God's judgment. In addition to this sin of fighting with one another, they, they are committing a greater sin by bringing these issues before uh, the high court of a particular state. What will a Hindu judge think of the Christians when they are fighting over property, church property? This mainline church, that mainline church, that mainline church. I'm not uh, giving the names. But you know what I'm hinting at. What will the Hindu judges think of the Christians fighting amongst themselves over property? Are, it is difficult for the righteous man to go to heaven. These disputing parties who are bringing disrepute to God's name, will they ever go to heaven? So, dear friends, <clears throat> the problem has to be solved in-house. Whatever is the problem. Are they not wise people who will sit and uh, settle the matter? Who will say who is in the right and who is in the wrong? Dear friends, <clears throat> again I repeat, unless we connect to New Testament scripture portion, the purpose of Bible study is not achieved. So, in the matters of litigation, what does Apostle Paul say? Or what does the New Testament instruction say? Bring it before the church leaders. Whatever is the dispute between two Christians, bring it before the church leaders. The Lord has given them the wisdom to solve the problem. And if the church leaders themselves are nominal Christians, I repeat, if the church leaders themselves are nominal Christians, if they are the tares amongst the wheat, then that's what happens. The problem gets escalated. It goes to the high court before Hindu judges, before Muslim judges. And the name of the Lord is tarnished publicly. So Apostle Paul is taking the Corinthian church to task. He says, Are, one day Christians, that means genuine Christians, they will be judging the world along with Lord Jesus Christ after his second coming. And a time will come when the Lord will elevate us to such a place that we will be judging the angels. So how come you, you, you guys are taking this petty matters to the ungodly judges. So, dear friends, Bible study is like a mirror. When we examine our faces or our appearance before the mirror, the mirror shows us for what we are. Similarly, the scriptures are like a mirror. They show us for what we are. So, let us examine, let us introspect. If there is any problem with a fellow Christian, inside a local church. Are we trying our level best to solve it in-house? Or are we unnecessarily bringing it before the Gentile judges, whereby the name of the Lord is tarnished? If a Christian is concerned about God's glory, listen to me very carefully. I'll come to the verses below in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If a Christian, a genuine Christian is concerned about God's glory, he'll be willing to be victimized rather than put the Lord's name into disrepute. He'll say, let me suffer the losses on account of this nominal Christian's behavior. Let me suffer the losses. No problem. But I will not bring it before the Gentile judges because I'm more concerned about the Lord's name rather than my money. Alleluia, praise the Lord. I'm more concerned about my heavenly father's name rather than my money which I would lose. 
because this person has acted in a wrong way. Go down, sister. Go down to verses 6 and 7. Chapter 6. 6 and 7. Yeah. First Corinthians 6, no, Pastor? Yes, sir. 6 and 7. But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this is in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Why not rather be cheated? If you are concerned about God's glory, you will be willing to incur a loss rather than putting the Lord's name into disrepute. And when you are willing to incur a loss for God's glory, let me tell you, God will compensate you mightily. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. When he sees this Christian, he is so concerned about my name. This Christian is so much concerned about my reputation. He is willing to incur a loss rather than fight this case in front of unbelievers. He is willing to incur a loss to protect my name. Will the Lord keep silent? I am asking you a question. Will the Lord keep silent? Will not the Heavenly Father come into the picture? Give me yes or no. Yes, Pastor. Yes. Heavenly yes. Father will come into the picture. He will compensate us for the losses. And he will take the, the person who is in the wrong to task. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I have seen it with my own two eyes. I walked with the Lord for 41 years. A person who is in the wrong, the Lord will take him to task. And the person who has willingly incurred the loss to protect God's name, the Lord will compensate him mighty. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are you all with me? So, dear friends, as I shared with you at the very beginning of my Bible study, unless we come to the application part, the purpose of Bible study is not achieved. Till we connect to the New Testament scripture portion, the purpose of Bible study is not achieved. Okay? So, let's go to the next W, brother, Chandu. First is, winding, how the case should be wound up. How the case should be wound up. That's why I use the W, wind up. Okay? Brother Chandu is pointing a cursor at the caption below. Okay? Wind up. Means how the case should be uh, completely be wound up. Wound up means finished. Okay? And then we come to the next W. And that is way of life of the ruler. Because uh, ruler stands as a representative of God as an example before the public. So, what does the Lord say about the ruler? Now, dear friends, before uh, I ask Sister Jayamala to read from uh, verses 14 to 20 of Deuteronomy chapter 17, I am asking a very elementary question. Okay? <laughs> Who built the first temple of the Israelites? King Solomon. Huh? <laughs> King Solomon. Okay, very elementary question. Right answer. Then again, I'm going to ask you one more question. The three books in the Bible, first, Proverbs, or major section of the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Who wrote? Solomon. Same person, King Solomon. King Solomon. Very good. So, is Solomon used in ministry or not? Next question. Yes or no? Very elementary, I'm asking. No. Yes, Pastor. Yes, right answer. So, a person who has been involved in God's ministry, if he doesn't take the word of God seriously, what can happen to him? He is a person who has been, again I repeat, used in God's ministry, constructed God's temple, the first temple, wrote three books in the Bible, okay? Actively used in God's work. But if he doesn't obey what is written in the Lord's word, what will happen? Dear friends, listen to me very carefully before we go into verses 14 to 20 of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17. Sin has been compared to a python snake. Okay? 
snake is devilish. Okay, we all know the punishment, divine judgment on the snake is it will crawl on the ground and eat the dust. Okay, so snakes are devilish. <laughs> so a cobra snake with one bite, it can kill. But what does a python do? Can it kill instantaneously like a cobra? No. No. It puts one ring after the other on the victim's body. It can be a human being. It can be uh, it, it another animal. It puts rings one after the other. If you come out of the first ring itself, you're saved. You have delivered yourself. You have escaped from death. But if you are lax, not taking seriously, the first ring put over you, the second ring will, will be put, the third ring, and then the constriction starts. Then all the bones are broken. So, with this in background, let us go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17. All these things have been written to serve as a warning for us, is it not? Now, with this in background, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 onwards. Uh, Sister Jayamala will read. And at that point of time, I'll be asking Brother um, Israel, Brother Chandu, go back to that slide. I'll be asking Brother Israel to be ready with 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 28. Okay? 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 28. And also 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Brother Israel will be ready with these two scripture portions. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 28. And 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Even as Sister Jayamala is reading from verses 14 to 20, she will halt at 16 and 17. Okay? She will all halt at verses 16 and 17. My way and God's way. Okay? Sister, please go ahead. 17, 14 to 20. 20 you can when halt you at verses 16 and 17. Sure, Pastor. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. Continue. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must now, not take... You should not take many horses and more so, do not go back to Egypt. Okay? Let us see what King Solomon did. First Kings chapter 10 verse 28 says, Brother Israel. First Kings chapter 10 verse 26. Little I will study. I will read and go to 28 verse faster. Okay, brother. Solomon right. built up a great stable of horses with a vast number of chariots and cavalry. 300 chariots in all and 12,000 cavalrymen who lived in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. Verse 28. Solomon's horses were brought to him from Egypt and southern Turkey where his agents purchased them at wholesale prices. Now, let's go back to the slide. Okay. Brother Chandu, <clears throat> let's focus upon it. Why is the Lord insisting that, you know, don't have a large stable of horses and do not go back to Egypt? The Israelites' protection should come from the Lord's presence. The biggest sin, let me tell you, dear friends, is not the sin of murder, is not the sin of adultery. The biggest sin is the sin of pride. Again, I repeat. The biggest sin is not adultery. It is not theft. It is not even murder. Because the biggest sin and the first sin committed in the heavenly realm was that of pride. In which Satan indulged it. Pride leads to a downfall. The moment you have large number of horses with you, if there is a war, will you be looking at your horses or will you be looking at the Lord? Give me an answer, no? If there is a huge army of cavalry, large number of horses. If there is a war, the horses, 
their eyesight will not be on the Lord, but on the horses. And who is actually the protection for Israel? The Lord. Israel is God's people. They are his inheritance. Uh, can we read uh, Sister Jayamala from Psalm 100 verse 3? What does Psalm 100 verse 3 say? You are my people. I have created you. Israel has been created by God. Yes, he has created the entire world. But he has not given the entire world the law. Yes. He has entered into a covenantal relationship with them at Mount Sinai. And he has given them the law. He has bound himself with a relationship with the nation of Israel. Psalm 100 verse 3, sister. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So, they are Lord's property. If there is a war, at what should they look at? At their protector, at their fortress, at their shield, or these horses? They ought to look at their shield, their fortress. What is Psalm 18 all about? Psalm 18 all of, is all about, you know, David calling the Lord as his refuge, as his fortress, as his shield. So Solomon, look at that, his gradual downfall after being used mightily in God's work, written three by, books in the Bible, constructed the temple, active in ministry, but step by step, look at his downfall. Then, continue sister, what else the king should not do? First, let, let him not establish large number of, let him not have lot, uh, large number of horses, it says. Let him not have a big stable, it says. Let him not go to Egypt, it says. Solomon is doing exactly that. Okay, then continue. Verse 17, yeah. verse 17 onwards. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself Sister, on a scroll. You can stop here. <laughs> Let us go to the slideshow. Now, uh, Brother Israel will be reading from 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Do not take many wives. More so, heathen wives who can lead you astray. Do not be uh, yoked with unbelievers. Do not be yoked unequally. First Kings chapter 11 verses 1 to 6. Brother Israel. King Solomon married many other girls besides the Egyptian princess. Many of them came from nations where idols were worshipped. Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon and from the Hittites. Even though the Lord had clearly instructed his people not to marry into those nations because the women they married would get them started worshipping their gods. Yet Solomon did it anyway. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines and sure enough, they turned his heart away from the Lord. Especially in his old age, they encouraged him to worship their gods instead of trusting completely in the Lord as his father David had done. Solomon worshipped Astoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the horrible god of the Ammonites. Thus, Solomon did what was clearly wrong and refused to follow the Lord as his father David did. Look at that. Now, let's go to the next slide, Brother Chandu. Brother Chandu? Yeah. Next slide. Look at that. Solomon's downfall. Solomon's glory and downfall. Okay? Now, I, I shared with you that unless we connect to New Testament, the purpose of Bible study is not achieved. So, let us look at the similar portion or a similar instruction in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 onwards. Sister Jayamala will read. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 onwards. Please underline all this in, the, uh, in your Bibles. Because the purpose of Bible study is to connect OT with NT. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 onwards. Warning yeah. against idolatry. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what do or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, 
I will live with them and walk among them and will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Thank you, sister. Many of you might have heard about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a wonderful preacher used in the 20th century in Great Britain. And in his church, some of the church members would come and tell him, see, we are about to marry an unbeliever, but we are hopeful of bringing that unbeliever onto the path of salvation. You know what he would do? Charles Adam Spurgeon, it would, it would bring a smile to our lips. He would climb a table, okay? He would climb a table, stand atop the table, and look at Brother well, Chandu. <laughs> Immediately showing us the picture of uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He would climb atop the table and stretch out his hand to a person who has brought this proposal before him of wanting to marry an unbeliever. Okay? He would stretch out his hand and he would say, try to pull me down. I will try to pull you up. <laughs> try to pull me down. I will try my best to pull you up. Now you give me an answer using your common sense and logic. Who would succeed? Person who is in the uh, who is down pulling a person from the top, or a person who is in the top pulling a person from the bottom? Down the one on the table. Yeah, because there is gravity force also. Is it not? Not only is he pulling, there is gravity force also. So then Charles Haddon Spurgeon would say, These are the chances of you converting an unbeliever into a believer and these are the chances of you being a believer becoming an unbeliever. These are the chances of you being in the pathway of righteousness becoming unrighteous. There are more chances of you becoming unrighteous than your would-be wife or would-be husband becoming righteous. All these things have been written to serve as a warning. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. What happened in Solomon's life? Did he obey uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20? The way of a ruler? No. His, his downfall was gradual. It did not happen in an instant. It was not cobra bite. It was python putting one ring after the other on him. And finally, what happened? He became an idol worship. So, a person who was so active in ministry, who constructed God's temple, who wrote three books in the Bible, if such a person can go astray, how careful we ought to be in our day-to-day -day Christian living. Again, I am repeating, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 onwards, which was read out to us by Sister Jayamala. That is the equivalent of Deuteronomy chapter 17, Verses 14 to 20. Let us be careful because nothing is more precious than our salvation. Nothing is more precious than our relationship with the Lord. And for a Christian's life, the end is as important as the start. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. The end is as important as the start. How does Apostle Paul end his life? With the Words of a fighting warrior, victorious warrior, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. I have fought the good fight. Sister Jayamala will read for us and then we will close. There is an announcement to be made also uh, that will take some time. So I'm closing here. We have come to the end of chapter 17 of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, there is one more portion which I'll focus upon when we restart that God told the kings to write down the laws. Not only to read the laws, but to write down. Uh, the neuroscience uh, scientists or the neuroscience doctors, they say when you write down, chances of remembering are much more. Okay, anyway, I'll focus upon it in greater detail when we restart our Bible study. So here, we'll close with the victorious declaration of Apostle Paul towards the end of his life. 
Second Timothy chapter four verses uh, six and seven, sister. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the fight, faith. Now there yes. is in store for me the crown uh -huh. of righteousness, which the yes. Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for this appearing. His Thank appearing. You. So I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. The end is as important as the start in Christian life and Christian ministry. We have seen so many cases right in front of us who have made the good start but did not finish properly. Cases of like K. A. Paul, even you know Ravi Zacharias. What all happened? Tarnishing the re reputation of the Lord tarnishing the name of the Lord by way of their behavior because they are seen as God's representatives. So, <clears throat> the Bible says, Solomon did not end his life the way his father David ended. De Solomon did not obey the Lord like his father David did. So, why? Was the downfall sudden, instantaneous? No, step by step. Had he been careful about the instructions written in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, the end would not have been like that. So, dear friends, all these things have been written to serve as a warning for us. The end is as important for us Christians as the beginning. If the beginning is glorious, let us strive hard to make the end also glorious. Let us always look into the scriptures. Remember the scriptures, write them down, store them in our heart so that when the temptation comes, immediately we defend ourselves by using the scriptures like Jesus did. That is why the psalmist says in Psalm 119 verse 11, Lord, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin. What did Solomon do? Did he follow Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 14 to 20? No. And what was the end result? Tragic. All these things have been written to serve as a warning for us. So, dear friends, as Christians, let us resolve to memorize the scriptures, to store them in our heart. Follow the Lord closely, so closely that even air should not come between the Lord and us. Leave alone, uh, you know, heathen wives or anybody like that. Okay? So, <clears throat> let us uh, close here. Uh, I'll offer a small closing prayer and then the formal closing prayer will be done by Brother Stephen today. Father in heaven, once again we praise and thank thee, O Lord, for this time which you have given to us to gather here in this forum set up by the family of Brother Benoni Richards. Lord, we call upon thy blessings to be poured upon this family, O Lord, because they are using this forum. So many members of the Universal Church are blessed by this, including this teacher. I call upon thy blessings to be poured upon the participants also. They could have been elsewhere, but they have decided to spend this time in your presence because they love you and they want to grow scripturally and spiritually. Whatever lessons you have taught us, O oh Lord, enable us not only to be hearers, but also doers. In Jesus' holy precious name we pray. Amen.